Thank you, Eric. And uh, I would like to start and thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk here. Um, and as we all heard in the last couple of days, we know that autologous CAR T cells uh, demonstrate remarkable remission rates in relapse and refractory ALL and in B cell lymphomas, and with the best results achieved in pediatric patients. And it provides us with the treatment uh, where actually none existed before. In this talk, I will focus on the preparation of pediatric patients for the treatment, and I would later share with you the results of our CAR T cell uh, production study. And uh, yesterday, I thought that I'm only one that um, wrote some learning objectives, because that's what we were required to do. <laughs> so um, looking at that is to identify the essence of child preparation for medical procedures define the main problems in pediatric aphoresis, and outline the challenges of aphoresis uh, for CAR T cell production. And um, as we all know, the first step in manufacturing CAR T cell is actually to collect autologous uh, CD3 positive lymphocytes by aphoresis. Um, following a uh, referral for CAR T cell treatment, each patient undergoes a detailed um, review of eligibility for the treatment, and the eligibility screening requires adequate organ function, including lungs, uh, heart, cardiac, renal, and uh, it's quite similar to um, the consideration for stem cell transplant. Although patients with uh, active and uncontrolled infections are not appropriate candidates for that treatment. Now, once eligibility is um, established, a meeting is scheduled with the medical team, and that's in order to obtain an informed consent. Now, within the pediatric patient cohort, an informed consent is obtained from the patient uh, legal guardians, and it's most probably the parents. Uh, but there are some conceptual um, difficulties encountered in trying to apply the framework of informed consent uh, in the pediatric setting, in which uh, most of our patients either lack the ability to act independently or have limited or actually no capacity for medical decision making. And the goals of the informed consent process are uh, the same in the pediatric and in the adult population, and are grounded in the same ethical principles of beneficious justice and respect of autonomy. Um, looking at the um, informed consent, um, there are actually three um, um, uh, duties are encountered in looking into the informed consent in the pediatric population. And the first is provision on inf of information to the patients and to the guardians, um, and information about the illness, the condition, uh, the diagnosis, the treatment, um, the risks, the benefits, and uncertainties about the treatment. And then we want to um, assessment of the patient and the surrogate understanding of the information and their capacity for medical decision making. And the last one, we want to ensure that there is a voluntary agreement with the plan. Now, when we are uh, conducting um, research in children, uh, the usual protocol, again, is for the parents or the guardians to consent as proxies, but for the children to give assent. And assent means that they agree with, uh, to take part in the treatment. And unlike informed consent, assent is not always required by law. Different countries have different um, um, uh, laws regarding assent and uh, different age that uh, kids need or must give assent or can uh, consent their treatment. So it really varies and it's not always required by law. In order to take part in the assent process, uh, the children must be mature enough to understand the trial or the treatment and what they are expected to do. 
We want to help the patient to achieve a developmentally appropriate awareness of the nature of their condition. We want to make a, an assessment, a clinical assessment of the patient understanding of the situation. And uh, we want to solicit an expression of the patient's willingness to accept the proposed care. And us nurses uh, taking care of children, I think, uh, sometimes kids, even young as seven, uh, may be able to take part in an ascent process. Uh, the age really varies. It depends on the child uh, and on if it's a search or, you know, any other uh, treatment and the institution regulation regarding ascent uh, in, in children. <coughs> but the age really, really varies and um, depends on many elements. Looking into the consent for CAR T cell treatment, I think we are currently in a period of time of transition from clinical studies, although they will continue, uh, to a medicinal product. If we're looking into Kimraya by Novartis, they, it's designed as a medicinal product. And therefore, the, their consent actually focuses on the patient privacy, since it's, it's a drug that is manufactured from a patient material. But uh, if we're looking at the whole process of the CAR-T treatment, I think the consent uh, should include descriptions of the risks and the benefits that are associated with each um, stage or part of the treatment, starting with the leukapheresis, the lymphodepletion therapy. As we all heard, there's uh, lots of time in need for um, bridging chemotherapy. And then the side effects that are associated with the uh, treatment, with the cytokine release syndrome, the CRS, the immune effector cell-associated neurotoxicity syndrome, the ICANS, which is a new um, um, phrase for uh, the neurotoxicity, and uh, all the intensive care support that is associated or might be associated and needed uh, along the treatment. Looking into aphresis in children, uh, pediatric aphresis is considered safe, but it is a challenging process. The child size and the small blood volume are not a barrier for collection but they may increase the risk for adverse events. Looking at the main problems during aphresis in children, I think the first is the extracorporeal volume of the cell-separated device is static. If we're looking at the spectra optia that many of us are using, the minimum extracorporeal volume is 147 mLs, where the maximum is 191 mLs. And that means that due to the small size of the children, there is a need for blood priming of the cell separator prior to the um, starting the aphresis. And uh, the blood priming varies ac um, according to the child weight. And different centers have different uh, protocols. And I think many centers will blood prime um, the uh, cell separator if the kids are weighing less than 20 or 15 kilos. And there are centers that are blood priming even for all kids weighing less than 25 kilos. So it's not just they come in the morning and they, we collect them to the uh, cell separator. We need to prepare the thing. Um, the need for a good venous access is essential for the success of the procedure. Uh, there is a slow innate rate that is required in aphresis in very small children, and uh, this can lead to delays in establishing and maintaining a stable interface. And that increases both the time of the procedure and the um, uh, amount that is uh, blood is, is processed. And again, different centers have uh, various procedures regarding uh, cell ac uh, venous access. Um, there are centers who will um, insert a central line for all kids smaller than 18, and other centers have uh, different um, procedures, as I will show you a bit later. Um, the other, the third, I think, main problem is uh, symptoms that are related to citrast-induced hypocalcemia, and. Um, 
those signs need to be promptly recognized and treated. And aside from the classical signs of uh, symptoms of uh, hypoconsemia as in older kids or adults as um, perioral numbness, uh, prosthesis of the hands and the feet, muscle cramps and uh, nausea and vomiting, in low body weight children, sometimes the first sign could be restlessness and abdominal pain. And we need to supplement all kids with uh, calcium, uh, either PO or IV. And again, it depends on the different um, procedures in the different centers. So I think it's not um, a must that you need to give IV calcium, and each center has its own um, guidelines for that. But beside from all those technical issues, I think that uh, the same importance and even more important is the approach with the child and the family in order to prepare them for their freezes procedure and to obtain their cooperation. In 2015, there were evidence-based standards published for the psychosocial care of children with cancer and their families. And it was a collaborative work of um, uh, experts from the US, Canada, and the Netherlands. And they actually published those standards of uh, psychosocial care. And I would like to point out the standard number eight. Youth with cancer should receive developmentally appropriate preparatory information about invasive medical procedures. All youth should receive psychological intervention for invasive medical procedures, and I think that by no means a freezes is an invasive medical procedure. So special care is really required in order to prepare the children uh, for the, uh, to go any kind of medical procedures. And assessment is a crucial complement of procedural preparation and intervention. And evaluation of the child's developmental and cognitive abilities, as well as their preference of delivery of information are really paramount. Attaining the child preference allows us to deliver the type and amount of information that they need. And some youth prefer uh, detailed information, and while others want to have a very general description because too much information can increase their anxiety. So we need to be very specific and to learn what the child's um, specific needs are. And as I always say, I think we need to get help from the parents who know the kids the best. Um, and the information provides the uh, children and the adolescents with a sense of predictability and control. There's been foundational research in pediatric psychology that established the importance of providing <coughs> children with information uh, through modeling, rehearsal, books, puppets, or medical play. And again, we need to, for each child and each family, to look what is the best way for them to receive the information, what will help the child the best. And the preparation should be developmentally appropriate, well-timed, and the timing is very important, not too far away from the procedure and not too close to it, and it really depends on the age. And um, uh, it should include the descriptions of the sequence of the events that will occur, as well as accurate and honest information about what pain and other sensations they might um, uh, feel or experience. Um, with the small kids, uh, I really like to uh, use a lot of medical play because I think it helps them to kind of play a little bit. And you know, sometimes they come into my room even you know a month after, and they still want to look at the dolls and play around for them. So it's something that is very helpful. With the older kids, we can give them information she, um, booklets or sheets and show them the real stuff uh, quite early. So it varies. <laughs> Looking at the collection for CAR T cell production, uh, we can find the circulating lymphocytes within the mononuclear layer. Let's see where the pointer is. As you could see here, marked in white. 
And this layer actually provides us with the cells that we need for, uh, to start the uh, process of the manufacturing. Now, the most similar uh, procedure for uh, collection for uh, you know, CAR T cell production is the collection for donor lymphocyte infusions. Since in both procedures, our target cells are mature lymphocytes. However, lymphocyte infusion donors, they're healthy, they have normal white blood cells count and normal lymphocyte counts, which is not exactly the case with our patients. So uh, I think that the principles of aphresis protocols are not really easily transferable for the T cell collection for CAR T cell production. When our patients have sometimes normal white blood cells, but many times they have normal white, uh, low white blood cells count, they have significant lymphopenia, and many of them have been pretreated with um, chemotherapy, some of them underwent transplant with or without radiation, and some of them have other disease-related uh, complications. So it makes it much more complicated. Um, now, looking at the timing of aphoresis, uh, it is crucial too. And I think nowadays we have basically two options. If we're looking into the institutional-based studies, uh, we're most probably will use a fresh product, uh, and we have a rapid turnover from the time of the collection to the time of the administration of the cells. But if our patient, if, if our patient will get the commercial product, it's a frozen product, the time from the aphresis to the product is a minimum of one month, and as we heard in you know, sometimes it's even longer. So if we know that our patient will undergo, um, is eligible for the commercial product, we'll need to plan the aphresis much earlier. Um, so we have enough time to the production process and that, um, you know, we will spare him for um, getting a lot of chemotherapy until the cells are ready. So I think timing is crucial and we need to know where is our, uh, what is our aim and what is our patient going to get. And now I would like to share with you our current uh, clinical uh, trial for, um, uh, you know, we're producing our um, CAR T cells program at the Sheba Medical Center uh, in Israel. It was, uh, the study was approved by the uh, Institutional uh, Review Board of our center and by the Israeli Ministry of Health. Looking into the inclusion criteria, uh, age is one to 50, but I will report only the pediatric cohort. A uh, patient need to have adequate organ function with a Lansky or Konofsky scale of at least uh, 50%. Uh, they need to have any kind of relapse or refractory B cell malignancies with expression of uh, CD19, and they had to have at least two line of standard therapy before being eligible for the CAR T cell. Patient who had previous um, uh, CD19 directed therapies, uh, even CAR T cells or ablinatumumab were eligible in this study too. Um, if the patient had a prior transplant, they need to have at least 100 days um, to be in 100 days uh, after transplant with no active graft versus host disease. Looking at the exclusion criteria is hyperleukocytosis, rapidly progressive disease, pregnant women, which is not really relevant to our cohort, and they cannot have any active infections. Looking at prior therapy, uh, they should be off steroids for at least two <coughs> weeks, off systemic neoplastic treatment for two weeks prior to the aphresis, and recover from all toxicities. Uh, I'll just show you this quickly. Is it from a recently published article, and they talk about their recommenda recommended timing to stop uh, therapies before leukophoresis, which is quite similar to uh, our study. It's more graphic, and you could see the pointer is working. So allogeneic transplant is three months, off steroids uh, three days or 72 hours, and so on. So it's kind of um, 
um, and it's really similar to our study. Uh, the outline of the study is um, once a patient is eligible for the treatment, they undergo aphresis. Usually the aphresis procedure is on a Monday. Uh, the cells are um, picked up by the lab and they are starting the uh, preparation of the, car of the CAR T cells. They isolate the lymphocytes, they stimulate them, retroviral uh, transduction and cell expansion. The cells are ready for infusion within 9 to 10 days. So as I said, the patient usually go on, have their aphresis on a Monday and then the next Sunday they are uh, admitted for the lymphodepleting chemotherapy and they are receiving the cells on Thursday. So it's a very rapid and short uh, turnover from the time of aphresis. We do recommend that all our patients will proceed with bone marrow transplant two months after uh, receiving of the CAR T cells. Um, looking at our cohort uh, between May 16 and uh, December 18, uh, 30 patients with relapsed refractory ALL and B cell lymphomas underwent aphresis. The median age uh, was 10 and a uh, aphresis for the CAR T cell production. The median age was uh, 10 and a half years old and a range from three and a half to 24. And the median weight was 33 kilos and the range was from 15 to 80 kilos. All patients went a single uh, leukophoresis uh, procedure. We're using the Spectra Optia on an automatic mode. For venous access, we're using, for most of our patients, peripheral veins. Um, and uh, for four patients who did not have adequate uh, peripheral veins for access, so at the start of the procedure, we inserted an arterial line, as you could see, for four patients. And we'll, for one patient who had a Hickman, we used the Hickman for the uh, access. Priming with blood was needed for one patient, the one who was weighing 15 kilos, and that's because currently we are blood priming only for kids weighing less than 15 kilos. Looking at the average length of the procedure was 193 minutes, range from 114 to 295, and there was no difference in the length of the procedure uh, comparing the peripheral veins to the arterial or the central line. The time was exactly the same. It might be because the groups are small, but I, I don't know. But that's, regard, that's what we have. Um, overall, we're looking only at the aphoresis. It was well tolerated. It's safe using peripheral veins in the majority of the patients. We did not have any um, complications or major complications. We did not have any citrate toxicities on those patients, and that's probably because we are supplementing them with uh, calcium. And with the calcium, uh, it depends on the kids. Um, if we can and if they're able to tolerate it, we give it PO and only for the young kids or the ones who feel sick, we give them IV. Our product, goal for production to start the process of CAR T cells was 400 million cells and uh, 27 out of the 30 achieved this goal. Uh, for the administration of the CAR T cell, the uh, goal is 1 million cells per kilo and only one patient received a l lower dose of uh, CAR T cells at 0.8, but he also um, responded to the therapy. Looking at the products, let's see if this works. Uh, here we can see the aphresis product. You can see it has CD19 positive cells and T cells, where the product at the aphresis, the product itself has no CD19. And here at the product, you could see you have both a CD4 positive lymphocyte and CD8 positive lymphocytes and CAR T cells. So that's for the product. Looking at the protocol, uh, if the patient had a low burden disease, they would directly go to aphresis and then, um, as I showed you in the study outline, be admitted to, the, uh, to get the lymphodepletion uh, chemotherapy with uh, fludarabine and cyclophosphamide and the CAR T cells. Patient with high burden disease, we had two options. Um, 
a small group of this patient first had a phoresis and then got a lymphodepleting induction therapy with, with FLAG. The majority of the patients with high burden disease got a Velcade ba based protocol for in induction and then we proceeded to a phoresis. Um, and afterwards, they all got the same uh, protocol with, uh, for lymphodepleting chemotherapy and the CAR T cells. Looking at response for the CAR T cell um, uh, treatment, from the ALL group, uh, 20 of the patients achieved complete remission after uh, the CAR T cell treatment. Five patients had no response for the CAR T cell treatment. With the non Hodgkin lymphomas, um, there were two uh, patients that were um, evaluable, evaluable, and the two of them uh, achieved CR. Out of the, we have here, as you could see, it's only 27 patients. We started from 30. We had, out of the 30, we had one production failure, so the patient did not receive uh, the CAR T cell and did not start the lymphodepletion uh, chemotherapy. And two patients had disease progression, so we did not proceed with the um, production of the CARs, and of course, they did not get it. So I think uh, to conclude, I think it's extremely important to appropriately prepare those kids and the families for the treatment so we can um, achieve their uh, cooperation uh, during the aphresis. And uh, the aphresis, although it's challenging, but it's feasible and it is safe. And as I always believe, I think we as nurses play a major role in the preparation. In our center, uh, there is a nurse who's doing the collection on, along with um, a technician. So um, I think as nurses, we have a very um, uh, important role in this whole uh, process of the uh, preparation and the treatment. And I would like to thank all my colleagues. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. So thank you very much, Daphne, for this clear overview. Questions? Well, I will start, start with one question. You talked about the collaboration with the <coughs> intensive care unit. Do you have a, se um, a special procedure for that? Um, well, you know, I talked only on the preparation before. So, uh, yes, our intensive care unit is very um, involved. And if we need to transfer the kids, you know, we continue there. You know, we, uh, our physicians and, you know, if the patient is being admitted to the ICU, they are there all the time and on call for the ICU people. But they were all um, uh, trained before of what to accept, expect and so on. So we have a good collaboration. Hi there. Hi. Thank you. Really um, excellent talk. Um, we are um, a phoresis department, but for adults, but we collect children. Um, so 15 kilos seems really low for yes. us for blood prime. Um, so I'm just interested to how you decide. Do you increase their hemoglobin before you decide to do that? or No, we go by the weight. I think it's something that, you know, we have discussions with, mm. you know, within our unit because if you look, the majority of centers, I think, are blood priming for uh, 20 kilos and below. And, uh, and I think the 15 kilos comes from the old uh, spectra that we used, mm -hmm. and the extra corporal volume was different, but um, we don't, you know, of course we, you know, we blood prime, we know the hemoglobin before, but um, we go by the weight, so, yeah. um, and we might change it, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Do you see other challenges regarding CAR T cell therapies as uh, in patients in children with allo or autograft transplants? You know, it's like the, um, you know, with the allogeneic transplants, so we don't, uh, you know, we collect the cells from healthy donors, and that's a different story. Um, although we have various ages and sometimes we have siblings that are quite young and they need to go this procedure, but that's really a totally different uh, story with the issue of the don pediatric donors. Um, and that's for another talk. 
And with the autologous, you know, it might, I think that kids who are going um, autologous um, collection of freezes, for instance, neuroblastoma or Ewing, usually you collect them much earlier in the, um, you know, in the process. So, you know, for, for instance, Ewing sarcoma, if they don't have bone marrow involvement, so they get two treatments and then, you know, we collect them. So their, their counts are better, you know, they get GCSF. It's, it's kind of, uh, some of the technical aspects are the same, but those kids, it's different. And the big question is how much cells do you need to collect? You know, that's, it's another issue, you know, with, this, with the collecting CD, uh, CD3, uh, CD34 positive cells, you know, you have a goal, that's what you need. But, um, you know, the companies have a much higher um, collection requirement than we do have in our studies. So it's kind of, I think we will learn more about it as we do it more. Okay, when well, there are no questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.